Unseen Warfare, as edited by Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain and revised by Theophan the Recluse. Chapter 1. What is Christian Perfection? Warfare is necessary to acquire it. Four things indispensable to success in this warfare. We all naturally wish and are commanded to be perfect. The Lord commands, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Matthew verse 48. And St. Paul admonishes, In malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. 1 Corinthians. In another place he says, Stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Colossians. And again let us go on unto perfection. Hebrews. The same commandment is also found in the Old Testament. Thus God says to Israel in Deuteronomy, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And David advises his son Solomon, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. After all this, we cannot fail to see that God demands from Christians the fullness of perfection, that is, that we should be perfect in all virtues. But if you, my reader, beloved in Christ, wish to attain to such heights, you must first learn in what Christian perfection consists. For if you have not learnt this, you may turn off the right path and go into a totally different direction, while thinking that you make progress towards perfection. I will tell you plainly, the greatest and most perfect thing a man may desire to attain is to come near to God and dwell in union with Him. There are many who say that the perfection of Christian life consists in fasts, vigils, sleeping on bare earth and other similar austerities of the body. Others say that it consists in saying many prayers at home and in attending long services in church. And there are others who think that our perfection consists entirely in mental prayer, solitude, seclusion and silence. But the majority limit perfection to a strict observance of all the rules and practices laid down by the statutes, failing, falling into no excess or deficiency, but preserving a golden moderation. Yet all these virtues do not by themselves constitute the Christian perfection we are seeking, but are only means and methods for acquiring it. There is no doubt whatever that they do represent means and effective means for attaining perfection in Christian life. For we see very many virtuous men who practice these virtues as they should to acquire strength and power against their own sinful and evil nature, to gain, through these practices, courage to withstand the temptations and seductions of our three main enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil, and in and by these means to obtain the spiritual supports so necessary to all servants of God, and especially to beginners. They fast to subdue their unruly flesh. They practice vigils to sharpen their inner vision. They sleep on bare earth, lest they become soft through sleep. They bind their tongue by silence and go into solitude to avoid the slightest inducement to offend against the all-holy God. They recite prayers, attend church services, and perform other acts of devotion to keep their mind on heavenly things. They read of the life of the Passion of our Lord for the sole purpose of realizing more clearly their own deficiencies and the merciful loving kindness of God. To learn and to desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, bearing their cross with self-denial and to make more and more ardent their love of God and their dislike of themselves. On the other hand, these same virtues may do more harm than open admission. To those who take them as the sole basis of their life and their hope, not from their nature, since they are righteous and holy, but, though, but through the fault of those who use them not as they should be used, that is, when they pay attention only to the external practice of those virtues, and leave their heart to be moved by their own volitions and the volitions of the devil. For the latter, seeing that they have left the right path, 
gleefully refrains from interfering with their physical endeavors and even allows them to increase and multiply their efforts in obedience to their own vain thought. Experiencing with this certain spiritual stirring and consolation, such people begin to imagine that they have already reached the state of angels and feel that God himself is present in them and at times engrossed in their own contemplation of some abstract and earthly things, they imagine that they have become completely transcended of this world and have been ravished to the third heaven. However, anyone can clearly see how sinfully such people behave and how far they are from true perfection, if he looks at their life and character. As a rule, they always wish to be preferred to others. They love to live according to their own will and are always stubborn in their decisions. They are blind in every, everything relating to themselves, but are very clear-sighted and officious in examining the words and actions of others. If another man is held by others in the same esteem, which in their opinion they enjoy, they cannot bear it and become manifestly hostile towards him. If anyone interferes with them in their pious occupations and works of asceticism, especially in the presence of others, God forbid, they immediately become indignant, boil over with wrath, and become quite unlike themselves. If, desirous of bringing them to self-knowledge and of leading them to the right path of perfection, God sends them afflictions and sicknesses or allows them to be persecuted, by which means he habitually tests his true and real servants. This test immediately shows what is hidden in their hearts and how deeply they are corrupted by pride. For whatever affliction may visit them, they refuse to bend their necks to the yoke of God's will and to trust in his righteousness and secret judgments. They do not want to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, who humbled himself and suffered for our sakes, and they refuse to be humble, to consider themselves the lowest of all creatures, and to regard their persecutors as their good friends, the tools of their salvation, and helpers in their salvation. Thus it is clear that they are in great danger. Their inner eye, that is their mind, being darkened, they see themselves with this and see wrongly. Thinking of their external pious works and deeming them good, they imagine that they are already reached perfection, and puffing themselves up, begin to judge others. After this, it is impossible for any man to turn such people, except through God's special influence. An evident sinner will turn towards good more easily than a secret sinner, hiding under a cloak of visible virtues. Now, having seen clearly and definitely the spiritual life and perfection do not only consist in these visible virtues, of which we have spoken, you must also learn that it consists in nothing but coming near to God and union with Him, as was said in the beginning. With this is connected a heartfelt realization of the goodness and greatness of God, together with consciousness of our own nothingness and our proneness to every evil, love of God and dislike of ourselves, submission not only to God but also to all creatures for the sake of our love for our God, renunciation of all will of our own, and perfect obedience to the will of God, and moreover desire for all this and its practice with a pure heart to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians From sheer desire to please God, and only because He Himself wishes it, and because we should so love Him and work for Him. This is the law of love inscribed by the finger of God himself in the hearts of his true servants. This is the renunciation of ourselves that God demands of us. This is the blessed yoke of Jesus Christ and his burden that is light. This is the submission to God's will, which our Redeemer and Teacher demands for us by his word and by his example. For did not our Master and author of our salvation, our Lord Jesus Christ, tell us to say when praying to the Heavenly Father, our Father, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. And did not he himself exclaim on the eve of his passion, Not my will, but thine be done? And did he not say of his own, of his whole work, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him that sent me. John. Do you not see what all this means, brother? I presume that you express your readiness and are longing to reach the height of such, such perfection. Blessed be your zeal, but prepare yourself also for labor, sweat and struggle from your first steps on this path. You must sacrifice everything to God and do only his will. Yet you will meet in yourself as many wills as you have the powers and wants, which all clamor for satisfaction, irrespective of whether it is in accordance with the will of God or not. Therefore, to reach your desire, to reach your desired aim, it is first of all necessary to stifle your own will and finally to extinguish and kill them all together. And in order to succeed in this, you must constantly oppose all evil in yourself and urge yourself towards good. In other words, you must ceaselessly fight against yourself and against everything that panders to your own wills, that it excites and supports them. So prepare yourself for this struggle and this warfare and know that the crown, attainment of your desired aim, is given to none except to the valiant among warriors and wrestlers. But if this is the hardest of all wars, since in fighting against ourselves, it is in ourselves that we meet opposition, victory in it is the most glorious of all. And what is the main thing? It is most pleasing to God. For if, inspired by fervor, you overcome and put to death your unruly passions, your lusts and wills, you will please God more and will work for him more beautifully than if you flog yourself till you draw blood or exhaust yourself by fast more than any ancient hermit of the desert. Even if you redeem hundreds of Christian slaves from the infidels and give them freedom, it will not save you. If with this you remain yourself a slave to your own passions and whatever work you may undertake, however glorious, and with, with whatever effort and sacrifice you may accomplish it, it will not lead you to your desired aim. If you leave your passions without attention, giving them freedom to live. Chapter two, one should never believe in oneself or trust oneself in anything. Not to rely on oneself is so necessary in our struggle, my beloved brother, that without this be assured, not only will you fail to gain the desired victory, but you will be unable to resist the smallest attack of the enemy. Engrave this deeply in your mind and heart. Since the time of the transgression of our forefather, despite the weakening of our own spiritual and moral powers, we are wont to think very highly of ourselves. Although our daily experience very effectively proves to us the falseness of this opinion of ourselves, in our incomprehensible self-deception we do not cease to believe that we are something, and something not unimportant. Yet this spiritual disease of ours, so hard to perceive and acknowledge, is more abhorrent to God than all else in us, as being the first offspring of our selfhood and self-love, and the source, root, and cause of all passions, and of our downfall and wrongdoing. It closes the very door of our mind or spirit, through which alone divine grace can enter, and gives this grace no way to come and dwell in a man. And so it withdraws from him. For how can grace which comes to help and enlighten us enter that man who thinks of himself that he is something great, that he himself knows everything and needs no outside help? May God preserve us from the disease and passion of Lucifer. God severely reprimands those who are stricken with this passion of vainglory and self-esteem, saying through the prophet, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Isaiah 21 And the apostle tells us, Be not wise in your own conceits. Romans 16 While God abhors this evil conceit in us, there is nothing he loves and desires to see in us more than a sincere conscientiousness of our nothingness and a firm and deep-felt conviction that any good we may have in our nature and our life comes from him alone since he is the source of all good, and that nothing truly good can ever come from ourselves, whether a good thought or a good action. Therefore, he takes care to plant this heavenly seed in our hearts of his beloved friends, urging them not to value themselves and not to rely on, our, on themselves. Sometimes he does this through the action of grace and inner illumination, 
or sometimes through external blows and tribulations, sometimes through unexpected and almost unconquerable temptations, and sometimes by other means, not always comprehensible to us. Yet, although expecting no good from ourselves and not relying on ourselves is the work of God in us, we are we on our side must take every effort to acquire this disposition doing all we can all within our power and so my brother i offer you here four activities by means of which with god's help you may end by acquiring disbelief in yourself and learn never to rely on yourself in anything one realize your nothingness and constantly keep in your mind the fact that by yourself you can do nothing good which is worthy of the kingdom of heaven. Listen to the words of the wise father, Peter of Damascus, assures us that nothing is better than to realize one's weaknesses and ignorances, and nothing is worse than not to be aware of them. Philokalia. Saint Maximus the Confessor teaches the foundation of every virtue is the realization of human weakness. Philokalia. St. John Chrysostom says, He alone knows himself in the best way possible, who thinks of himself as being nothing. 2. Ask for God's help in this with warm and humble prayers, for this is his gift. And if you wish to receive it, you must first impart in yourself the conviction that not only have you no such conscientiousness of yourself, but that you cannot acquire it by your own efforts. Then standing daringly before the Almighty God, in firm belief that in His great loving kindness He will grant you this knowledge of yourself, and how He Himself knows, do not let the slightest doubt creep in you that you will actually receive it. 3. Accustom yourself to be weary and to fear your innumerable enemies, whom you cannot resist even for a short time. Fear their long experience in fighting us, their cunning and ambushes, their power to assume the guise of angels of light, their countless wiles and nets, which they secretly spread on the path of your life of virtues. 4. If you fall into some transgression, quickly turn to the realization of your weaknesses and be aware of it, for God allows you to fall for the very purpose of making you more aware of your weaknesses so that you may thus not only learn to despise yourself, but because of your great weaknesses, may wish to be despised also by others. Know that without such desire, it is impossible for this beneficent self-disbelief to be born and take root in you. This is the foundation and beginning of true humility, so it is, since it is based on realization by experience of your impotence and unreliability. From this, each of us sees how necessary it is for a man who desires to participate in heavenly light to know himself and how God's mercy usually leads the proud and self-reliance to his knowledge through their downfall, justly allowing them to fall into the very sin from which they think they are strong enough to protect themselves against, so as to make them see their weakness and prevent them from relying full-heartedly on themselves either in this or in anything else. This method, although very effective, is also not without danger, and God does not always use it, but only when all the other means we have mentioned, which are easier and more natural, fail to lead a man to self-knowledge. Only then he finally lets a man fall into sin, great or small, in accordance with the degree of his pride, conceit, and self-reliance, so that where conceit and self-reliance are absent, instructive failures do not occur. Therefore, if you happen to fall, run quickly in your thought to humble self-knowledge and a low opinion and sense of yourself, and implore God by persistent prayer to give you true light, so as to realize your nothingness and confirm your heart in disbelief in yourself, lest you again fall into the same or even worse and more destructive sin. I must add that not only when a man falls into some sin, but also when he is afflicted by some ill fortune, tribulation or sorrow, and especially a grievous and long-drawn bodily sickness, he must understand that he suffers this in order to acquire self-knowledge, namely the knowledge of his weakness, and to become humble. With this purpose and to this end God allows us to be assailed by all kinds of temptations from the devil, 
from men and from our own corrupt nature. St. Paul saw this purpose in the temptations he suffered in Asia when he said, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. 2 Corinthians And I shall add another thing. If a man wants to realize his weakness from the actual experience of his life, let him. I do not say for many days, but even for one day. Observe his thoughts, words and actions. What he thought, what he said, what he did. He will undoubtedly find that the greater part of his thoughts, words and actions were sinful, wrong, foolish and bad. This experiment will make him understand in practice how inharmonious and weak he is in himself. And if he sincerely wishes himself well, this understanding will make him feel how foolish it is to expect anything good from himself or to rely on himself alone.